Li Bo was one of the more significant and interesting figures of the classical Chinese age of the Tang Dynasty, starting in the early 600s and lasting until the early 900s. It's a significant chunk of time and a great bulwark of civilization. Uh, Li Bo, also known as Li Po or Li Bai, uh, is interesting because he was generally acknowledged to be one of the greatest uh, uh, poets of the era and a time that produced quite a few, uh, but also because less because he was iconoclastic within that tradition. He was not a, uh, a comfortable fit for anyone, and much of what we like about him uh, comes from his rebellious streak, and that can be awfully fun, especially uh, in the modern era. Looking back, there are a lot of uh, idiosyncrasies of his personality that resonate, that are fun that make his poetry something more than just official lyrics written for official occasions and the standards of the day. You don't need to be a great scholar of Chinese history to read Li Bo and say, wow, this guy's fun. Um, he's, he's more than fun. He's, he's interesting and he's profound, uh, but he is at bottom also quite fun. Um, within that, you can see uh, a kind of romanticism, almost, within his work. A, a fierce independence and a uh, rejection of societal norms. He was a, uh, a little bit of a, uh, a rebel within, uh, within his society. He famously did not... Uh, I uh, did not take the easy routes of government service where educated young men were generally supposed to go and find success. Uh, he, he got appointed to one early post and got fired essentially after, uh, after a couple of years and banished uh, reportedly because of drinking on the job. He was a, uh, he liked a, he liked a good, he liked a good he liked a good drink of wine every now and then. Let's just say that. Um, how accurate that image is, is a question for historians. Um, I would say it can be a little bit of a pose sometimes in the, uh, in the poetry. It seems to function that way in a somewhat nuanced thing where, yes, he writes about drinking, but it seems to be about more than drinking. And so the drinking becomes a kind of vehicle or symbol for something else, for something artistic that is uh, open to some debate as to how sincere the initial uh, imagery of drunkenness is. Some of this, I understand, hinges on the word zui. Forgive me if I'm uh, mispronouncing that, Z-U-I. Roman letters that that means anything, which can uh, can mean two things: both the uh, the physical inebriation and the uh, the spiritual detachment that comes from that. The uh, the aesthetic feeling that comes from inebriation, shall we say, which doesn't necessarily imply inebriation itself or you know you don't have to you don't have to uh to drink to feel a little buzz is how you could put that um but lebo is always playing upon these nuances and that's part of what makes it fun makes it fun you can appreciate him for the uh for the the ribaldry of it for the drunken frat boy sometimes of always wanting to go out and have a drink um and and, and that's sort of charming in its way but uh but it is almost always in his uh in his better uh better work uh, it is always hinging on this alternative, on this other interpretation that takes you a little bit deeper and gives you something a little bit more substantive than just a conventional drinking song, which certainly he could write, uh, but 
you know, would that necessarily last the last, uh, you know, 1500 years? I don't know about that. Uh, not quite that much, but very eh, close. Um, you can you can see his personality come through in just about everything he wrote. Even when he's writing fairly formulaic, um, occasional verse in a time when lyric poetry uh, in the culture was to uh, commemorate occasional uh, occasions, like somebody leaving, you write him a little poem, you know, an official celebration of the government, you write a little poem, and. He certainly produced an awful lot of that, but always with a very identifiable human touch within it. It's never just an official poem. It is personality. Um, the sun rises and sets, gives you a sense of that. Uh, the, sun the sun comes up from its nook in the east, seems to rise from beneath the earth, passes on through heaven, sets once again in the western sea, and where, oh where, can its team of six dra dragons find, ever find any rest? Its daily beginnings and endings, since ancient times never resting, and man is not made of its primal stuff. How can he no long, how can he... How can he linger beside it long? Plants feel no thanks for their flowering in spring's wind, nor do trees hate losing their leaves under autumn skies. Who wields the whip that drives along four seasons of changes? The rise and the endings of all things is just the way things are. Jihi, jihi, why must you always drown yourself in these wild and reckless waves? What power had Lu Yang that he halted your course by, course by shaking his spear? This perverts the path of things, errs from heaven's will. So many lies and deceits. I'll wrap this mighty mud ball of a world up, all up in a bag and be wild and free like chaos itself. <laughs> you gotta love that last stanza that that one like i'll wrap this mighty mud ball in a world uh, uh of a world up in a bag um you but this is a poem about the sunrise and sets it's about uh a kind of uh time it uh, the sun rises and sets is, is a marking of time but it's also something that happens every day so it's both it's it, it it's a consideration of the uh the distinction between eternity and rigid relentless time the passing of time you get the sense of um of, of human limitations within that uh we're caught within that we are striving for the eternal perhaps but we're caught within time um you know man is not made of this primal stuff we are limited uh you get uh, he's drawing on also traditions of older uh, older legends and updating them and considering them in new lights. Uh, he the team of six dragons ever find any rest. This is going back to a mythological past of uh, who brings who carries the sun across the sky, uh, and he's reconsidering this from a more modern perspective. From uh, his particular perspective, is generally considered to be a Taoist uh, uh, tradition. But he's, he's just looking at these different iterations of culture stuck in time, striving for, uh, again, striving for the eternal, striving for something uh, ephemeral, striving for something transcendent, but always stuck in uh, the actual, in the real. Um, and the, the power of Liu Yang, an, a, an old mythical hero who stops the sun in its tracks so he can have more time to fight on the battlefield, uh, he, he's questioning that uh, and he's, he's considering that somewhat of a, uh, an aberration, obviously it would be, uh, but it's human interference in the natural order. It is natural for the sun to set. We have time in our world and so when a hero comes and interrupts that um interferes with it in any way shape or form that is an aberration and you get the sense that 
this uh, again, this is kind of a Taoist thing. From Lebo's perspective, you don't interrupt nature. You don't uh, scar the beauty and the divine presence of nature by fiddling with it. Um, and so he's seeking to at once transcend nature and become more than nature, but um, he knows that it can't happen. You know, I'll wrap this mighty mud ball of a world up in a bag and I'll be wild and free like chaos itself. He's yearning to transcend nature, this mighty mud ball, uh, but he can't. Um, you can't dismiss the world order in order to achieve transcendence. It's got you stuck. Uh, Uh, south of the walls we fought gives a great image of uh, a medieval imperialist wars uh, in the um, uh, in those perilous times. It was a very heavily uh, militaristic uh, time. There were there were a lot of wars. There was a lot of fighting, and he saw some of it. And here he's writing about, you know, he's throwing out place names that are going to ring bells with people who perhaps were on that battlefield or perhaps uh, studied about it, more likely. Um, and he's ringing all these out and he's bringing them up in very realistic, visceral terms. It's not great battles of, uh, you know, of our glorious history. He's, you know... Uh, He's capturing something of uh, the imagery of what it would be to be there at the time, and it is very anti-idealist. It's not a pretty picture at all. Beacon, beacon fires blaze without ceasing. This is the third stanza. The marching and battle never end. They died in fighting on the steps. Their vanquished horses neigh, morning and morning to the sky. Kites and ravens peck men's guts, fly with them, dangling from their beaks, and hang them high on, on boughs of barren trees. The troops lie mud smeared in grasses, and the general acted all in vain. Wow, uh, that's not something you generally get in a history book, I'm guessing, of the time. Uh, accounts of battles are supposed to be quite heroic, and this is very much not that. Uh, this paints it in fairly stark and disgusting terms. Uh, significantly again, however, you see uh, the, the birds pecking at the men's guts. However heroic those men may have been in battle, they are still returning to nature in a somewhat visceral way. Um, it's, uh, it's something. Um, probably his most famous uh, poem is "Bring in the Wine." Again, when you, whenever you bring out the uh, the drunken Luce, um, uh character, it's fun. And but he does something more with it. He he's playing on that double meaning of drunkenness. Um, where he's calling for wine, you know, look there at the waters of the yellow river coming down from heaven, look in the flow in the sea, never turn back again, another sense of flowing time, look there bright in the mirrors of mighty halls, a grieving for white hair, this morning blue black strands of silk now turned to snow with evening, this is a sense of aging, the both both opening images of this poem, passage of time, sense of inevitability, sense of nature. Uh, it is the river and the man similarly, or the person similarly, marking the passage of time. Um, for satisfaction in this life, taste in this life. Taste pleasure to the limit and never let a goblet of gold face the bright moon empty. <laughs> Which again has that kind of Epicureanism uh, uh, feel to it, a, a, an early romanticism of it, you know. 
uh, sing and be merry for tomorrow we may die. Uh, it's uh, it's gathering your rosebuds when you while you may. It is all of these uh, sentiments balled up in a in a sense that we need to enjoy this moment. We need to make the most of the here and now around us. Not worry so much about what's coming or what happened in the past, but live in the now. He does this while saying, hey, let's all just get drunk. Um, you know, I'll toss away a thousand in gold, it comes right back to me. Does he really have that much money? I don't know. But he's saying in this, uh, on, on one reading it can be, hey, drinks are on me, don't worry about the cost, or he is saying material possessions have no value. You can take it both ways. They're not mutually exclusive. Um, in, you know, uh, so boil a sheep, butcher an ox, and make merry for a while, and when you sit yourself to drink, always down 300 cups. Doesn't specify how large a cup is. I'm thinking this is an exaggeration, but again, he's going for the gusto. He is not limiting himself. He is trying to feel the potentiality of the moment in the moment. Uh, he calls his friends, keep the cups coming. Uh, I'll sing you a song. All I want is to stay dead drunk <laughs> and never sober up. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm not sure when he wrote this. Maybe he was a college sophomore at that time. Who knows? Um, a gallon of wine costs 10,000 cash, all the joy and laughter they please. So you, my host, how can you tell me you're short, short on cash? Go right out. Buy us some wine, and I'll do the pouring for you. And I'll take my dappled horse, take my furs worth a fortune, and just call the boy to get them and trade them for lovely wine. And here together we'll melt the sorrows of all eternity. So here, you know, um, the mixing of the earthly and the eternal, sorrows and the eternity. Uh, he's ending on eternity, which seems to be, to me, to be the real goal of this whole drinking thing. Uh, he is less interested, I would say, in just getting rowdy drunk than in feeling that ethereality that comes from inebriation, that sense of leaving the material behind. Um, that's an important notion. He develops that same basic idea uh, in uh, Drinking Alone with the Moon. He writes an awful lot about the moon and it's a frequent character in this moon. Uh, a pot of wine among the flowers I drink alone, no friend with me. I raise my cup to invite the moon. He and my shadow and I make three. The moon does not know how to drink. My shadow minds my my capering, but I'll make merry with them both, and soon enough it will be spring. I sing, the moon moves to and fro, I dance, my shadow leaps and sways, still sober we exchange our joys, drunk, and we'll go our separate ways. Let's pledge beyond human ties to be friends, and meet where the silver river ends." Um, where the silver river ends seems again like a uh, a reference to eternity uh, to me, um, a kind of transcendence uh, after the austerities of life, after, after the difficulties we transcend into the universe and find uh, eternity, uh, very Taoist. Uh, again, uh, a pot of wine among the flowers, mm, he's there. In the other poem, he had friends with him, at least he's calling to them. Uh, here, he drinks alone, uh, significantly. He's alone an awful lot. He doesn't have an awful lot of friends, it seems like, uh, at least just to read his uh, work. Although he seems like a fun guy, I don't know. Um, I drink alone and my, no friend with me. Now, maybe he conjures the moon to be his friend, maybe he's lonely. This is a significant possibility. Loneliness is a recurrent theme throughout his work. But it, it, I think it's more than that because he identifies a third, and I think that's where it gets interesting. Uh, the third here in his little party is his shadow, uh, and he sees the moon himself and his shadow 
as a trio of friends. Now, he couldn't have a shadow with it in the nighttime without the moon. The moon provides the light that creates the shadow. So that makes it a company. The moon is also abstract. It is distant. It is in the heavens. It, you can make that all you want. The wine has a significant purpose here. Um, I sing, the moon moves to and fro. I dance, my shadow leaps and sways. So they're all having a, a party. Still sober, we exchange our joys, drunk, and we'll go our separate ways. You can interpret this a bunch of different ways, but what I kind of like to think of is that when you, uh, when he is, um, when he is sober, he can see his shadow and he's walking around and it's right there. When he is drunk, he goes his separate ways. How do you leave your shadow? And where is it when, when you do leave? Well, your shadow is always on the ground. Your shadow is always on the earth. And maybe when you're drunk, you transcend the earth. Maybe you fly, you float, you drift up into the heavens, you experience eternity. It's kind of, he, he's always playing with that trope. He's always straddling that line. Um, but again, uh, maybe he's just lonely and he's making friends with whoever will have him. Again, he was kind of a rebel, kind of an outcast. And you get the sense that maybe he didn't work and play well with others all the time. Um, question and answer in the mountains. They ask me why I live in the green mountains. I smile and don't reply. My heart's at ease. Peach blossoms flow downstream, leaving no trace. And there are other earths and skies than these. Um, you can take this, again, a bunch of different ways. Uh, you can say that, well, you know, somebody, somebody goes and asks you a question and you just smile and don't reply. That's not particularly social. You can see why he maybe doesn't have too many friends. Living in the mountains in general, you're probably not you're probably more of a hermit than if you were living down in a village or a city or something like that. So, you know, there are a couple of things there. Um, is a pose, I would say, of independence and sufficiency, yet the fact that he's noting it in a poem makes it seem like he's aware that he is lonely from time to time. Uh, and he feels almost defensive, you know, my heart's at ease. He has to s declare that I'm okay with this. I'm okay with being alone. Uh, you know, peach blossoms flow downstream, leaving no trace. It's beautiful. It's passage of time. This peach blossom is moving through time. It's a river flowing downstream. It's an image of time. Uh, passing through time, it's beautiful in its moment, and then it disappears. Again, very Taoist, um, but also just a, a little sad because that peach blossom is floating down all alone, and it disappears. It just vanishes into nothing. And you can see that sense of loneliness there, that sense of questioning, you know, is this all, is this all I have? Is this all I can have? Um, summer day in the mountains, another thing in the mountains. Lazily waving a, flan a fan of white feathers, stripped naked here in the green woods, I take off my headband hanging on a cliff, my bare head spattered by wind through pines. Image of him alone in nature. Uh, my bare head splattered by wind through pines. Uh, almost swallowed by nature. Um, I a lot of his imagery has to do with the individual himself, usually in nature, but not, uh, but being essentially um, swallowed by it. Uh, having your individuality challenged by the enormity of nature. Uh, the road to Shu is hard. It, he talks about a journey. Uh, there that is, uh, you know, up a mountain, he's a big mountain climber, uh, early before Plutarch even, or before Petrarch even, a uh, big mountain climber. Uh, and he is 
uh, always confronting nature and finding himself somewhat overwhelmed by it. The road to shoe is hard. Ah, it's fearsome. Oh, it's high. The road to shoe is hard, harder than climbing to the sky. Uh, and, and he talks about this enormous um, challenge, this enormous landscape that he's confronting, that uh, he, he's trying to get through. Um, and, and just the imagery within that is so visceral. You get the sense that the, it is more potent, more alive, the, the landscape, more alive than the individual looking at it. Uh, to face danger and such fear, alas, from such a distance, sir, what could have brought you here? Dagger Peak is high and steep. Even a single man can keep the pass from thousands, though he may be, become a wolf or a jackal and betray. By, night, by day we dread the savage tiger's claws, by night the serpent's jaws, its sharp, blood-sucking fangs bared when it mows down like hemp, like hemp stalks the lives of men. Though Chengdu is a pleasure dome, better to quickly turn back home. The road to Shu is hard, harder than climbing to the sky. Leaning, I stare into the west and utter a long sigh. Um, terrified by nature, in a sense. Um, the hardships of traveling the road. Uh, Clear wine in golden goblets at 10,000 a peck, prized delicacies on jade plates worth a myriad cash. But I stopped the cup, threw down the chopsticks, was unable to eat. I took out my sword, stared all around. My heart was blindly lost. I wanted to cross the yellow river, but ice blocked the waterway. Was about to climb the Tanghai Range, but snow darkened the sky. At my ease, I let fall a line, sitting by the side of the stream longed to be aboard a ship again and dreamt of the realm of the sun the hardships of traveling the road hardships of traveling the road how so many branching roads and where now am i the long wind will smite the waves and surely will come a time to hang straight the cloudy sail and cross the gray blue line confronting nature yearning to transcend it yearning to um uh, to find eternity, uh, but it's a hostile environment. Um, it is an all-encompassing environment that keeps you from the transcendent. Um, mm, The flocks of birds have flown high and away. A solitary cloud goes off calmly alone. We look at each other and never get bored. Just me and Jingping Mountain. Sitting alone by Jingping Mountain. Uh, he's alone. Mountain. Uh, he's making a friend out of nature. Uh, and um, finding fulfillment in that. Just me and my friend. Uh, we never get bored. Um, and another mountain uh, called Heaven's Crone, a song on visiting Heaven's Crone Mountain in a dream on parting. He, he posts a relatively longer lyric. Um, it's what, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, like 12 stanzas. Um, not, each stanza is not particularly long. But you get the sense of, uh, uh, of this preoccupation with nature again, where he paints it, uh, he paints it as a dream um, and a time that he did visit. And this is almost Wordsworthy in the way that he is recalling nature from a later time uh, when he is perhaps separate from it. Uh, and he, he gives uh, more visceral images of, of nature um, a thousand peaks and ten thousand turns my path was uncertain I was lost among flowers and rested on rock when suddenly all grew black bears roamed and dragons groaned making the cliff streams quake the deep forests were shivering tiered ridges shook 
clouds hung blue, portending rain, troubled waters, giving off mist, the sense of impassable nature. Um, impassable, but also impassive. It is just there, and it doesn't really take notice of him at all. But he's confronting it, and he's trying to find his way through. And it's, uh, it's awe-inspiring. Thunder rumbling in lightning cracks, hill ridges split and fell, then the stone doors of caves to heaven swung open with a crash, a billowing vast blue blackness whose bottom could not be seen, where sun and moon were gleaming on terraces silver and gold. Which is almost like he's glimpsing a vision of the afterlife, glimpsing a vision of the beyond, something uh, eternal, uh, something so awe-inspiring, so momentous in its natural imagery and power that he's dumbstruck. Their coats were of rainbow, winds, in the, winds were their steeds, the lords of the clouds came down in their host, tigers struck hearts, phoenixes drew coaches in circles, those who were undying stood in ranks like hemp, all at once my soul was struck and my spirit shuddered, I leapt up in dazed alarm and gave a long sigh. This image of all creation, this image of the ancient mythology, this image of transcendence comes and what happens when he sees it? He wakes up. I leapt up in dazed alarm and gave a long sigh. I was, on, I was aware only of this moment's pillow and mat. I had lost these myth, those mists and bright wisps that had been there just before. Then he gets to the point. All pleasures in our mortal world are just like this. Whatever has happened since ancient times is the water flowing east. Water flowing, passage of time, ephemerality, eternity. When I leave you now, you go. When will you ever return? Just set a white deer out to graze upon the green mountain sides. And when I must go, I'll ride it to visit mountains of fame. And he, 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 he levels the, the hard punch. How can I pucker my brows and break my waist serving power and prestige? It makes me incapable of relaxing heart or face. The, um, the power of that imagery. Uh, something he had seen in the past and remembered of the experience of being in nature, of feeling that awesome, awesome quality to raw, huge nature. Uh, that feeling inspires him and he dreams about it when he goes to sleep, but then he wakes up and he looks around and he's got to go to work and he's got to bow and scrape and do all the things in a bureaucracy that middle functionaries do. How can I pucker my brows and break my waist? Serving power and prestige, it makes me incapable of relaxing heart or face. Social obligations versus private fulfillment. He's always caught in that struggle. He's always caught in a lot of struggles, but this is the primary one. The yearning he has to experience transcendence, to experience eternity, to experience anything but what he has, which is the world and the reality of it and the mundane details of life that he just can't shed. Lebo, Lipo, Libai, whatever you want to call him, he is a very human character beating in the heart of an empire.